Jason Peters, and I am the chair of Gen Next. Uh, Gen Next is a branch of the United Way, and we are young individuals, 20, 30s, those young at heart, young professional students, and people from the community that want to give back to Thunder Bay to be community impactors to make a difference in our, in our city that we live in. Um, our host again for On the Menu will be Catherine Brooks. Catherine is the Community Engagement Coordinator for Thunder Bay Counseling Centre and a recent, well I guess not so recent anymore Catherine, um, but a member of the Gen Next Cabinet. One of the things that we're really excited about is if you like the feel of what you see today, if you want to be a community impactor in your workplace, um, if you want to find out more about how to make a difference, um, connect with Gen X. Reach out with us. We've got Gen X in the workplace. Uh, we will support you, uh, the employer, um, through engagement, through connection, um, through, again, being a community impactor through a bunch of different initiatives. Um, in the workplace and in the community. So we'll put up some more information. Um, we're really grateful for our partner, TBATEL, to bring Gen X into the workplace. So again, if you got questions, don't hesitate to connect with Gen X. Catherine, please take us from the garden to the table. Thanks so much, Colleen. So welcome everyone. We are so excited to have our on the menu from the garden to the table today. Um, Gen Next is so excited to be bringing these series um, to the community and although um, it's virtual, it's so great to connect with everybody. So these workshops will be happening every third Wednesday of the month and we'll be running them until December. So they'll have lots of different topics um, and they'll be 60 minute sessions and it's just really for everyone to learn and gain insight on different topics um, and learn about different things within our community. So stay tuned for that and especially our next one, which is on July 15th. So on the menu for July 15th will be best bang for your buck. Um, so we'll have more information on that coming. And so stay tuned on our website. So before we start with our presentations today, um, I'd just like to remind everyone that we are going to have all of our participant microphones on mute um, just to allow for our keynote speakers um, to have minimal distractions. And following all of our keynote speakers, we will have a um, short question and answer period. So throughout the presentation, feel free to type in your questions to the chat box um, and send them along. So you can send them um, in our public chat, which will go to everyone, or you can send them directly to me. So I'll be in my messages as Catherine Brooks. So feel free to send those. Um, so, now uh, we'll start our presentation. So it's a pleasure uh, to introduce our first speaker, who is Rena Vibeck, who is the Education Coordinator from Lakehead Region Conservation Authority. Uh, so welcome, Rena. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Catherine, and hello, everybody. So um, I'm so glad to be uh, presenting to you today in my own backyard. So although I would have liked to have brought you to a virtual field trip at a conservation authority, I was a little worried about um, connection issues. So I'm here in my backyard and I'm really fortunate to be in a rural area. So I'm going to share with you um, things that you will find in your backyard um, or at least in our region. And I'm going to um, encourage you during my, my 15 minute chat and maybe for the other portions as well, um, to really experience what I'm experiencing, which is the benefits of the outdoors. So if possible, if you're on your phone, um, I, I'd like to encourage you to head outside with your phone. Um, and if you're on the computer, is it possible for you to get closer to a window, open that window, and just take a look at the greenery that's potentially outside your window and breathe in some of this really hot, fresh air? Um, because as we know, the field trips and the experiences that we have outside aren't just about um, the species that we learn about, but it's about the experience and the feelings and the mental and physical health benefits that we get from being outside. So I want you to virtually and literally experience this with me if you can. Um, and before I get started, because I'm not um, familiar with everyone's background, um, I'm going to start with some of the basics. So getting outside, especially this time of year, today's a hot day. Um, I don't have a hat on because I, I was worried about 
the lighting that you'd see my face and so on. But I would wear a hat. I'm also wearing um, for sun and bug protection. I have this, this great sun bug shirt and I would encourage you to get something like it and to, and to think about always wearing longer sleeves. Um, we've heard about ticks in our area, specifically the black legged tick that carries Lyme's disease. Um, and it's just not worth um, your health. So I am fully dressed for bug uh, wear. Starting, I'm gonna head into the back. So I'm gonna wear my boots. I've got my bug jacket, um, my sun hat. I've got my uh, Lakehead Region Conservation Authority whistle for safety. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to head out. So if you're heading to a conservation authority um, and you're, you're new to that, to that area, bring some water, bring some food, make sure you take a look at the map before you head out. Um, be prepared for the heat, the sun, the bugs, as I mentioned. Um, and I'm wearing a bug jacket because I think when I head into the back here with you guys um, and I'm slowed down, I'm gonna be eaten. Um, so I'm gonna just pull my hood on so that I don't spend the whole time smacking. Um, and I'm going to just flip my camera around as I talk about some of our conservation authority areas and then I'm going to get into some plants. So um, if you're unfamiliar with our, our conservation area, we have eight conservation areas in the Lakehead region. Um, some of them are listed here. So Mission Island Marsh, Hercut Cove, Cascades, Little Trout Bay. Um, we also have forest management areas um, including Wishart Forest and Mills Block and then we've got Hazelwood, Mackenzie Point, Cedar Falls, and Silver Harbor. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the conservation areas. Uh, hopefully you can visit um, the spring, the summer. Remember that we collect $2 parking fees and that helps cover um, our, the upkeep of our areas. Um, you can also choose to get um, a $30 Explorer card, which covers you for the whole year. Um, so here's a little bit of information about that. Um, and enjoy our conservation authority areas with responsibility. Um, as in, if you have a dog, um, please keep it on leash, pick up after it, um, and uh, respect wildlife, obviously. And as we say, um, leave only footprints and take only photographs. And I think that's self-explanatory. So I'm going to get started um, and I want to look at some of the species that we're poten potentially going to find here in our area. Now, um, yesterday I knew I wouldn't be able to visit uh, my whole backyard and see all the flowers, but right now we can see, I, I picked these two bouquets of wildflowers just from my backyard yesterday. So this, these are some of the things that we're seeing blooming right now. We've got daisies, this, this one's mostly from my back field. Um, we've got dandelions. Here's some marsh marigolds, the very last of the marsh marigolds, the red clover, um, which of course, if, if you've ever picked these, you can eat them. They're delicious. Pull the little um, petals out and right at the base is like a, a honey, honeysuckle flavor, although um, don't eat too many. You'll get bloated. Um, and we've got bluebells that are um, all in bloom. Here we have our meadow anemone, beautiful white flower, and you can see um, real fields of them. They've drooped a little because they were picked yesterday. Um, down here we can see some purple vetch, and I think over in this bouquet I've got some yellow vetch, but of course it's the season of lupins and lilacs, um, and we're seeing these along the ditches, lilacs, usually where people have planted them. Um, I also found some wild columbine beautiful native flower to the area. Um, some Queen Anne's lace. I picked a few um, flowers from the flowering dogwood and you'll recognize dogwood shrub with the red, um, the red stems. And just recently the wild roses have started to bloom. So we may see some of these as I take you on a quick backyard tour, but I thought just in case we don't get to all of them, oh look, here's a butterfly literally enjoying this as we speak. Um, and of course, make your own bouquets or eat some of the flowers. Most of them, um, if not all of them are edible. Some people I've seen recently have been um, using lilacs to flavor iced tea or lemonade. 
um, I don't think um, on its own it would be it might be a little intense but it's a good flavor leave it in for about 24 hours with your drinks um, you could also choose to press it so my my kids and I recently pressed these wildflowers and they're great for making quick little bookmarks or you can make uh, some homemade cards with these um, so we're gonna hopefully see some of these I'm just recommending if you head out and you're loving birds bring a, a bird book with you um, and I've also got my own great little handout I love listening to bird songs and if you can hear some of them around me um, you you can start to recognize them by using these mnemonics so I, I heard you know just before the call started in my in my um, backyard the oven bird and the oven bird is easy to remember because as an oven gets hotter and hotter, so too does the oven bird get louder and louder saying, teacher, 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 teacher. And once you hear it, you'll know it. And as you're learning, if you, if you don't have a book or um, a supplement to a great field guide, I'm gonna just share my screen with you guys. And I'm going to recommend um, a great app called Song Sleuth. Here it is. Um, and what you can do is you can both record your songs that you're hearing and it will help you identify it. Or you can um, listen from the comfort of your home, some of the um, birds. And so that when you head out, you'll recognize um, their sounds. It's a great way to get to know them while also reading a little bit of information and seeing their picture at the same time. So, um, I'm also going to be, I'm just going to flip my camera again. I'm also gonna be talking a little bit about um, what um, foraging foods you might consider eating, but I wanna just be clear that I am not a foraging expert. And what I would recommend and a general rule of thumb is that before you eat anything new, um, you you check three credible sources um, to know what that species is and, and be sure that you have um, identified it correctly. And from there, you use um, what's called the universal edibility test. And there, you can look that up online, but um, you take a plant, you smush it up basically, and you rub it on your forearm. And that's your first stage. You're gonna test whether your skin reacts after about 30 minutes. Um, and if there's any reaction, obviously you're not gonna proceed, but if not, then you can then test for 30 minutes, you rub just the inside of your mouth. And again, 30 minutes later, you can then um, consume a little bit. Again, you're only ever consuming one new plant a day, kind of like babies when you're introducing new foods to babies. Um, so you can test out quite a few foods this way and get to know um, whether they're uh, of edible food. Um, so again, that universal edibility test. And um, we have a local um, foraging expert. Her name is Karen Stevenson. And I recently attended one of her webinars. And she has a website called um, wild edible foods and here's one of her guides so i recommend um, visiting that if you're thinking about eating a new plant um, going to her website she has lots of resources and you can purchase and um, some as there as well um, so that was that was my introduction <laughs> now i'm going to get into taking you guys on an actual tour so i want to i want to encourage people to feel confident when they're going out so let's start with some basics that we know we know you know white bark broad green leaves we know we know this is a birch tree so we probably are already more familiar with some of the species in our area than we think um, here on this birch tree is some chaga which some people um, will collect for its antioxidant properties um, and health benefits. Be sure to only ever collect it from a live birch tree and not one that is fallen or dead. Um, and of course, as we head back here, we've just passed the season of um, spruce tips. So the mature spruces um, that are growing their brand new buds and tips um, 
that new growth in the spring about a month ago um, was just the right um, size for eating. This is now gr grown too big. So this, these are spruce trees. Um, and although you can still eat it and benefit from um, some of the vitamins and nutrients in the spruce um, needles itself, they're a little more flavorful. Um, so more of that spruce flavor. I'm just heading over here to um, the red pines that are in our backyard. So you'll recognize they're part of the pine family. They're just beside some spruce. So on the right hand side of the spruce here, these are the red pines. And I gathered just some of last year's, um, one of its cones. And of course, red pine versus white pine, they both have long uh, needles. But red pine has two needles in a bundle and long, uh, whereas jack pine, they're, they're shorter needles. And white pine, just like the word white has five letters, um, white, uh, then the white pine has five needles in a bunch. So red pine has two needles and their bark is a little bit red on the underside. Oh, we've got a, a squirrel hanging out for our webinar here. But you can take a look underneath the bark of the red pine, it's a little bit red. So you can um, eat and consume the, the needles of a pine tree and spruce trees. You can make teas with them. Um, and again, they, they have lots of vitamins and nutrients um, that can be enjoyed. So I'm gonna head into the forest now. And what I'm looking for are a few common species that you might be able to find when you head to a conservation area or um, out on your own adventures. So here we All right, so we, we may have lost Rena there just with the connection. Yep, can you still hear me? All right, go ahead. Okay, so you can see it's gone from the purpley bronze, um, this is already starting to lighten, and then to the green, three leaves, um, and people can often get confused and a little worried that this is poison ivy, this is actually just wild sarsaparilla, and what's really great about it is it's a nourishing um, food, the young shoots can be eaten, the roots um, are used to, or were used, but can still be used traditionally to make um, tonics and drinks. The berries, which I'll see if I can find another one with some uh, flour, but they don't yet have the berries, um, can be made into wines or jellies. And you'll see this all over the forest floor. And here right behind us, not, not so much edible, but really common. This is, and you can see the size compared to my hand, large leaf aster. And I'm gonna pick one so that you can get a close look. They have fuzzy undersides. So very large, broad leaf on the ground as ground cover, fuzzy underside. These are your go-to toilet paper in the woods. They are a little more tear resistant and that soft, um, feeling underneath, perfect for taking care of your needs outside. All right, we're gonna go a little further down the path here. Let me know if the connection um, is another issue. Perfect, Raina. So we'll just, we'll have everyone send in their questions um, right now and we'll let you finish up. Okay, I just wanted to point out some ferns. Um, ferns are lovely and fiddleheads are something that are often talked about um, by foragers. These are not ostrich ferns and ostrich ferns are the ones you look for in that sort of mid to late May season before they uncurl. I can't even recreate but they're curled up. Ostrich ferns have that papery covering whereas these um, bracken ferns or lady ferns have more of like a fuzzy covering. Um, and then one last one I want to show was blue beaded lily, one of my favorites. I wish there was one with a flower right here. I knew we wouldn't make it very far, but they have these long, um, long oval uh, shaped shiny leaves. 
And in the summer, their flower, which these ones don't have the yellow flower, um, will turn into a blue bead, a dark blue um, berry, not edible, not edible, <laughs> um, but looks like a blueberry. And that's the blue beaded lily. And these are also edible, um, the young shoots and the young leaves when they first come up, um, they're great to eat. But otherwise, um, the rest of the plant is, is not edible. So I wish I could have taken you through some more um, of the backyard because there's so many things to explore. But I wanted to um, just sort of overall encourage you to, number one, get out and explore our conservation areas. Um, but also to consider um, what, what you can do in your own yard and in your own space to naturalize and bring some of these native plants um, home with you. So I think, Catherine, that was sort of your hint at I'm running out of time. So we'll just jump into some questions too. We have quite a few coming in. Sure. Um, so I'm just gonna scroll up here. Um, so one of the first questions, someone's looking and asking um, where they might find brochures or any websites about the conservation areas um, to be able to go out and explore um, with their family. Perfect. So Lakehead Region Conservation Authority is Oh, I think we lost you for a bit there, Rena. Um, I will hop in and say that the website lakeheadca.com. Oh, sorry, Rena's back. With that? Go ahead. We just lost you for a second there. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm not sure where I cut off, but head to our website, which is the Lakehead Region Conservation, or sorry, <laughs> lakeheadca.com. Perfect. And then so um, someone else is asking um, if you're able to, in the chat, even Rena, to send um, what the foraging book you showed was called, just so we have sure. that on hand and people can find those resources. Yeah, this one we purchased and it's through the website Wild Edible Foods. Um, and you can purchase her resources. It's Karen Stevenson. Um, she's a prof with LU and an expert in foraging. Great. So that would cover all plants and things in our region, correct? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Um, so now another question here is how do you tell the difference between hogweed and wild carrot? Um, I am not familiar. I wouldn't um, want to give you the exact um, definition over this. So I would encourage you to um, use either use a field guide or um, some naturalist apps and I'd wanted to highlight one of the apps actually on this call so I'll just share my screen one more to encourage you to go to seek which is um, an app through iNaturalist and what's great about it is all you do is um, use your camera feature and you go, um, well, I'm not in front of a very identifiable feature right now. Sometimes you need the flower to identify things, but if you simply, okay, it identified it. You, you scan with your camera and it's able to identify the species for you. Um, if you're uncertain still at that point, what's great is if you're connected to your iNaturalist um, account through Seek, then um, you can then connect to um, iNaturalist, which is um, your submission then gets um, reviewed by experts and you can have it verified um, if you've taken a picture. Great. So, um, so again, that's just called Seek, you said? Seek, S-E-E-K, Seek, and it's by iNaturalist. Fantastic. So one last And it's not question. just for plants, it's for all, for all species, although I found that it doesn't work very well for fish. Um, so it's still learning, but, um, you can always post to iNaturalist and have the experts, um, confirm for you. Great. So just one last question here. Um, so how would someone go about bringing natural plants into their home? Are they able to, um, like say for lupins, are they able to transplant them from the ditch to their yard? Yeah. So, um, 
digging up a good amount of the root system is important. And of course, giving it a good watering um, when you planted it. So lupins, um, although they started to flower right now, they might be better to transplant before they flower, but um, you can still do so. Again, um, dig up as much as you can. Um, and the, the forest soil that you're gathering it from is critical to um, why that plant is growing there. So consider both the quality of that soil and also the light um, that's coming through to where you're transplanting it to um, in order for it to succeed. Great. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Rena. I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much for having me and I'm looking forward to the other speakers. Absolutely. So at this time, um, we're going to move on to our second speaker. So I'm excited to present um, Aaron Beagle, who's the Executive Director at Roots to Harvest. So we're so excited for Aaron to join us today um, as Roots to Harvest is a United Way supported agency and they have done phenomenal work in our community um, through programming and different initiatives. So thanks so much for joining us, Aaron. Take it away. <laughs> Awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Erin, and I work here at Roots to Harvest, and I'm going to give you the most whirlwind tour of um, some of the things that we're doing over here at the Lily Street Urban Farm. Um, can you just remind me, Catherine, how, what time do you want me to be done by? Um, if we could wrap up sort of around uh, 1240, that would be awesome. 1240. Okay, got it. Okay, so hold on. I'm going to switch this around so you don't see me. So at Lily Street here, we're tucked in between Arthur and Victoria, and we have lots of different features. It's a really large site. All together, we have two and a quarter um, acres of growing space. We don't grow on all of that yet, but that's the plan. So I am wearing a hat, just like Rena suggested. I'm all ready for being outside. I want to show you a couple of things in our boxes, because I think this is really interesting. We use these planter boxes as transplant areas and for some of the things we want to keep contained. So um, this I think is really very interesting for Thunder Bay. This is sweetgrass that we were gifted and we continue to grow. Uh, I have a neighbor actually on my street who grows sweetgrass for some of his programs that he runs. And um, so we work with some of the indigenous organizations in Thunder Bay that they harvest it and braid it and use it for gifting. Um, the other things we have in here are some of the herbs. So we have some oregano and some mint uh, and some tarragon that comes back. And then we have some chamomile, which is typically a weed, but we actually harvest the chamomile and um, dry it out and do tea with it every year. So we make a blend of chamomile and mint tea. We call it chamomint as you would. Um, yeah, and then like chives. So things that we want to keep contained, we try to put in these containers because they can spread. We used to have a crap ton of rhubarb growing in here and we took a bunch of it out and transplanted it back at Roots to Harvest at our garden in the backyard there. Um, so we just have this little tiny sad looking baby rhubarb plant left. Um, but I think that rhubarb is one of the really interesting things in Thunder Bay as the like comes up early, everybody's got it, you wander a back lane and you can make pie. And so we love rhubarb, we take it every year. We still have some from last year. Moving on, um, and I mean, there's so many things. I wanted to like show you like, how do you actually harvest rhubarb? Because I think that's an interesting thing to talk about too, but you know what, that's what Google's for. So I'm just gonna say, there's an interesting way of harvesting rhubarb that you should look it up. Um, so one of the things you'll see here on a lot of our plants are these collars that we put around them. They don't look super Martha Stewart friendly, but they, are really great to keep out cutworms. So one of the biggest pests that people are seeing this year are, are these little worms called cutworms. They come out at night and they basically like they come up, they crawl on your plant and they saw it off. And so when you wake up in the morning, your plant is like timbered down and it's so disheartening. Uh, especially if you've like started it indoors and then you do your transplants and then all these cutworms. Cutworms live in sod and then come out and like love to find these things. So these collars have been really helpful. Um, we asked, we put a call out on the internet to ask for some. Um, diatomaceous earth, which is like, you know, sort of like shells on their little soft bodies. It's hard. Eggshells is another way of doing it. Um, and you can like use an organic spray. BT is an organic spray that you can use. But we're trying this right now. And then the other one is just a good old fashioned, like in your home garden, 
just get out there at 11 p.m. or 12 a.m. with a headlamp on and go and find those suckers and squish them and like love it like love to feel their bodies squishing and um, that you are killing them which is good so here's a damaged plant you can see that a cutworm has gotten it and we actually like we're we're trying we're hoping that this will stay alive it didn't go all the way through if it doesn't we'll take this whole thing off so that it doesn't promote disease and rot in the garden but any damaged foliage we want to get out of the garden so that it doesn't yeah it doesn't mold and rot uh, and attract other pests but if it hasn't gone all the way through and there's still some life in it you may as well give it a try so these collars have been pretty helpful i have to say you'll notice that we have posts up this is so that we're going to string all these cucumbers and plants up um, to save some space so these are really, really big plots um, that are a mix between seeds and transplants. There's some peas that we direct sow. Um, and you'll notice we use drip line and drip line is just like a really effective way of getting water right to the source of the plant instead of broadcasting water. But across the field from me over there, you can also see that we have some sprinklers on. You probably can't see that, but we do have some sprinklers on so we can sprinkle here. I'm just walking over really quickly to the strawberry patch and um, asparagus and garlic. So uh, if you want to grow strawberries, like don't totally look to us as the example. I think you would look at like Baloo's or Jewel's or some of these pieces that are doing it really well. But we have this strawberry patch. We're always sort of fixing it up. It's really, perennials are like a pain to weed all the time because you can't just get in there with the machine and like redo it every year. So anyway, um, you have your home plant, like your mother plant, and then it'll put out its uh, little runners to send out new plants. If you're transplanting strawberries for the first time this year, if you're like, I want strawberries in my garden, if you are doing the ones that are actually in the ground and not the hanging basket ones, I know a lot of people can buy those like ever bearing strawberry baskets, which is a little bit different. But if you're doing the ones in the ground, you plant your strawberries. If it flowers or when it flowers, you actually on year one want to cut those off. So you don't get strawberries the first year if you're really wanting to establish a strawberry patch because you want it to put all this energy into setting roots and getting really well established in your garden before you harvest. So the first year you would just transplant your strawberries, trim off your um, flowers, and then the next year you can let it flower and fruit. Uh, yeah, which is just, you know, it's a little bit like wait for the good stuff sort of um, technique. Here you'll see, like we have a blank field. We have one here and then we have three large um, blocks of blanks around. We rotate our fields every year so that we can build our soil. We're growing on what has been uh, grass for decades and decades. It's, so we're playing the soil game here. We're trying to grow good soil. So this has just been turned over and what has been planted in here is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a combination of some winter rye and those little bright yellow ones doo, 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 are uh, some clover seeds. So it's a cover crop. Oh, and I think there's some sunflowers in here too. Um, a cover crop is a green manure. You grow it in soil you're not using that year for food and then you plow it into your soil. You turn it back into the soil to regenerate good, micro, like good microbes in your soil. Um, and just really strong soil health so that it's, you know, it's airy and not so compact and it's got, you need life in your soil. So we try to promote that and we really notice differences uh, when we can grow cover crops. This is our garlic patch. It came up really well. Um, garlic is planted in about October usually. Traditionally in Thunder Bay, you can grow spring garlic. You don't get full bulbs from it. So garlic is planted as a clove and then it comes up. So when you know how to harvest garlic is what I, these have not escaped yet. If you remember what escape is, those tiny things that come up and they twirl and uh, you can harvest them. You harvest your escapes, cut them up and use them just like garlic. But you know you're ready to harvest your garlic when the bottom three or four leaves have turned brown. Then you're ready to pull your garlic. So that's just a heads up. Usually that happens, you know, end of July, early August, mid August, depending on what varieties you're growing. This is something that I think not lots of people have seen before. And uh, this is our asparagus patch. So the asparagus is gone, like it's, you know, we're past its season now, but it's gone into, it's sort of like fern-like feature. Um, look at this monster one. 
huge. So asparagus is a perennial. More people should grow asparagus. I just really feel strongly about that, that it's a really easy thing to grow in our climate. Um, it's a perennial that comes up every single year. It is like one of those vegetables. It's just like, hey, I grew this myself. And like everybody will think you're amazing if you like bring asparagus to the potluck that you grew in your own garden. So there's a difference. There's male and female plants. The females make these little um, seeds, or sorry, these little berries. Um, and when commercial, com commercial growers would rather actually grow male plants because they're more productive because they're not putting their energy into seeds. Uh, but anyway, this comes back. We love it. It's really special. Um, so that's a really, oh, and look, there's a pollinator. It is a honeybee. That's one of our honeybees. Oh, can you see that? It's even got pollen on her. So that's a, one of our worker bees that is uh, collecting, like looking around for some nectar and she's already got her pollen pants are full. So speaking of bees, I'm going to walk us towards the bee yard. On my other side here is we have a large community garden and there are about 30 community gardeners that have plots in this space that uh, it's a 10 by 10 plot and they can grow whatever they like. Here's some of the Roots to Harvest staff. There's Jordan and Gavin and Jana having some lunch, eating in a wheelbarrow. There's Casey having a cucumber. Awesome, so we're gonna keep on going past those guys and then heading over really quickly to the seed yard. Oh crap, I'm gonna run to the bees. You guys gotta see the bees, I'm running. Okay, you're gonna hear me start to breathe. But we also save seeds here. So that's spinach trials right over there. And then these are rutabaga and parsnips. Not that anybody eats those, just kidding. Don't tell Jana I said that. But um, rutabaga and parsnips, along with many other different kinds of plants, produce seeds every two years. They're called biennial. So you have to, oh, I'm out of breath. So you have to take the plant from last year, plant it again, let it go with flower, and then you get the seeds. And now we're in the bee yard. Oh my God. Okay, this is a bee yard. I'm gonna take you inside a hive really darn quick here. Um, hold on, I'm gonna flip my camera around. So we're gonna go into this hive here. And I think I found a place that I can tuck it and you can look at what I'm doing. If I drop you, I apologize. Ta-da, okay, hold on. We're gonna go in there. I'm gonna show you a bee frame. And I would say that like, if you're ever at a Roots of Harvest fundraiser and there's like, we're auctioning off a bee yard experience, bid on that thing, man, because it's fun. It's really fun to be in here. And um, there is just like so much stuff to learn. So I pulled out this hive because it's really a strong hive. And I want to show you two things. We have the bottom box and the top box. The bottom box is this one in front of me that you can see. And I've already taken the top box off. I'm going to take one frame out of the chop box because that's where they're making honey. Oh, now they're really alive. Um, this will literally just take a minute. Really want you to see it. On a hot day like this, it's pretty great. The bees are like doing their thing. They are trying to find honey. Okay, I'm going to put that one aside. You always put the first one aside to make some room. And then let's go find some honey in the middle here. Here it comes, I think. Oh, sorry, girl. So these are all, all the bees you see like flying around. Oh, there's a beautiful frame. It's getting there. So you can see that this stuff along the top here, there's beginning to cap the honey. This is very heavy because it's full of honey and it's kind of like glistening. Those are all worker bees. Worker bees are all female. The drones are the males. The drones can't sting you. And the drones, all they do is eat honey and look for uh, queens to mate with. The name of the queen in this hive, her name is Queen Elsa of Arendelle. We, all of them have names. Beyonce is also in this bee yard. Queen Elsa lives in this part of the hive. This is called the brood box. And I'm just gonna show you one thing. You just gotta bear with me. Don't cut me off. Here we go. There's like a million reasons why you use smoke, including it just sort of like messes them up a little bit. So here we are. 
Um, this is a frame from the brood box. So what you see here, it would be amazing if we actually saw Elsa right now, but she could be anywhere. But this is much lighter. They're, oh my God, there she is, for real. Oh my God, can you see that? There's our queen, she's got red on her. Hold on, where'd you go, girl? That's the queen, that never happened. I don't know if you can see her. Catherine, can you see her? Anyway, that's a queen bee. Awesome. She's there. And she's beautiful. They're all beautiful. I can't believe we pulled out the frame with Elsa on it. Okay. This stuff that's covered is called brood. Hi, little girl. That's all brood. So it's little baby bees that are going to hatch. Um, and then there's also probably some eggs and uncapped. So we try to make sure Elsa has room in here. This is interesting because we just went through this hive yesterday and there are still, whoops, some queen cups left over in Elsa's hive, which means they're trying to make a new Elsa, which we don't want. So we take those off. Anyway, that's beside the point. Okay, I am ready for questions. I'm done. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Erin. So yeah, everyone keeps sending in your questions, um, but we do have a few here. Um, so Erin, how would someone get um, started in um, being a part of the community garden? Oh, that's a good question. So um, every year we usually have a few plots that turn over. We post it on Facebook or Instagram to say so, or they should call the office like in the fall and just say, I'm interested in a community garden plot. Can I get put on the list? And then we'll call you back in the spring and let you know if you can or not. Awesome. And then another question um, here. So someone was asking, so is that smoke or is the hive steaming? No, nope, that's smoke. So oh. this is a smoker. I lit it and, uh, and it just kind of confuses the bees and it makes them go down and think that uh, they should start eating some honey and then they slow down and they're just, they're just sort of like, like if you notice, like they're so calm, they're really not concerned about me. So that's, that's what that's for. Awesome. Great. And so our last question here we have, so what is a good way to get information on how to run a community garden with a few friends on a larger lot? Oh, that's a good question. Like on how to run your own community garden? I guess so. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you can find an interesting space, like that's not being used, um, the first, like there's a community garden network through uh, the, the health unit. So you can contact them. And also there is, yeah, so that's the best way. And then, so they, and then they would help you with the city because the city like has deemed in any of its zoning community gardens are, you can have a community garden in all zoning types. Um, you just need to get permission and you need to find one that's, you know, not contaminated and, you know, it's accessible for people to get there somehow, but absolutely the city is open. I mean, I'm not going to speak for the city, but to exploring more community gardens for sure. There are about, I'm gonna say like seven to nine community gardens in our city already too. So there's lots out there. And if you go on the Center for Health Unit website, I think it's like nwofood.com or I don't even know, then you can find out where they are. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Erin. So great to speak with you and great to see Queen Elsa as well. Totally. Uh, so we're going to move on here uh, to our last presenter, which is um, launching into our cooking segment. So um, I'm pleased to welcome Rhonda Bill, the owner and chef extraordinaire of a fine fit catering and consulting. Um, so she will be showing us how to create a fresh and delicious light lunch um, using ingredients from your garden and from your backyard. So she will be making a seared walleye um, with early greens and a maple rhubarb vinaigrette. I'm very excited about. Um, so we did share the ingredients ahead of time. So if anyone wants to uh, make it along with us, that would be great. Uh, so thanks for joining us today, Rhonda, and uh, take it away. Oh, Rhonda, Rhonda, you're on mute. Hold on a second here. And then we're going to put the bees on mute. <laughs> yeah, put me on mute. Okay, now can you hear me? Perfect. Can, all right, you can hear me now? Yes. I will keep, I'll continue to speak loudly. So we are going to do a speed cooking session because I want to make everything for you in the next 
um, 14 minutes. So we're going to start with our walleye. Now, uh, my husband caught this walleye. You can do, um, I don't know if you call it walleye or pickerel. Um, you can also use any white fish. So I'm going to do a seared white fish for you for lunch today. And I'm hoping that a few of you are joining along and, and making it yourself. I love to do um, a, several spices to create a crust. And so I'm used to the blackened variety. So when you say blackened fish, it's a, it's a Caribbean term and it uses paprika and a lot of spices and it's quite spicy actually. And it gives a crust to the fish. So we're gonna lighten it up a little bit today because I want this to go with our fresh greens. So we are going to add our main ingredient is still paprika. So a spoon of paprika, if you're following along. A little bit of cayenne pepper. Some onion powder and garlic powder. And not too much salt. I'm gonna put a bit of salt in here. And then some black pepper. So it's not too hard. And we're gonna stir this together and rub it on that fish. I'm gonna move this to the side. And I'm gonna get my son, my 10 year old is my videographer today. Can, can you do a nice close up here? I'm gonna show this fish. So just. Um, How do you close up again? You can actually move the end, just take up the whole thing and move it over. And then you can tilt it whichever way you'd like. So this is my mixture here, and here's our fish. And I'm going to sprinkle it on the fish, creating our crust. You'll notice I took great care in taking out the Y bone here, or any of the bones, because I do feed my children this fish, and it's such a hassle to have bones Okay, so what you want to do is just give it a nice sprinkle. And then we'll let this sit for a couple minutes while we make our salad. Let the flavors develop. I'm going to set this aside and we'll sear it up right before we eat. Okay, so now we're moving on to our salad. Put these over here for now. And because I'm, I'm moving from raw fish to fresh veg, I'm gonna quickly wash my hands in the space. And by quickly, I mean 20 seconds, 20 seconds. Because the health unit has confirmed 20 seconds is an appropriate amount of time. So for our salad, I'm excited um, that Rena and Erin mentioned a couple of these things that we're going to be putting in our salad today. So we're going to start with um, rhubarb. And Erin mentioned rhubarb. I really enjoy it. I can collect rhubarb from various gardens. I have some of my own. Um, so I'm going to just show you a couple things with the rhubarb. First of all, um, these are just some of the younger rhubarb plants, you can see a little bit of the leaf here. Obviously, we're not going to eat the leaf because it is toxic. So we take, we remove the leaf itself. Um, for the rhubarb vinaigrette, we are actually going to create a vinaigrette using the juices from rhubarb. So instead of cooking it or anything, I'm going to use my frozen rhubarb that I've let Defrost, you can see there's quite a bit of juice in here. I'm gonna give it a squish it a bit. I'll just put the whole thing in here actually. Give it a squish. Whatever's left over is gonna be quite tart. And perfect for our vinaigrette. So put a little bit of that lovely rhubarb. We're gonna combine with our rhubarb. Cam, you can give them a little shot of this. A little bit of heat. This is heartbeat hot sauce. One of my favorites is pineapple. So a bit of pineapple hot sauce. Um, my favorite maple syrup. This is a northern, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. Norwester. This is from Norwest Maple. 
when you're making any vinaigrette, you want to combine uh, a couple flavor um, flavor combinations. So we're doing um, that bright, um, almost bitter, tangy flavor of rhubarb. Then we're going to add the sweet of the maple syrup, and then a little bit of complexity with old fashioned Dijon. So put a little bit of that in. And then we'll whisk this together, add some fresh cut pepper and some salt. And then any kind of oil will do. I love using this stuff here, it's avocado um, and sun sunflower oil, so that's lovely. I do about a one-to-one -one ratio. So this is my liquid and oil. And we're creating a semi-emulsion. It's not going to stay emulsified, but the, the Dijon really helps in this process. And then, of course, a little taste test, and we'll allow this to sit for a minute as well. Mm. I love the flavors. I love it. So we're going to put this aside. If you find that your rhubarb juice um, is not quite tart enough, you can always add a little shot of balsamic. I have a white balsamic and that really helps. Um, white balsamic, whatever you can find. Or um, a wine vinegar, so whatever you have. I'm going to add a, just a little bit more to create a little bit stronger flavor. Okay, so now let's put the rest of this salad together. So we've got our dressing. Um, I was able to find some greenhouse products here. So we've got De Bruins tomatoes are delicious. Um, De Bruins cucumbers and their live lettuce. And you can just see um, when you get your lettuce from a greenhouse right now, um, it contains the roots. It lasts quite a bit longer than regular lettuce. And then this is a shallot from my garden. It's an early shallot. It probably wasn't ready yet, but I pulled it anyway for this demonstration. So now we're going to move on to something a little bit more interesting. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Rena, uh, the dandelion is often seen as simply a weed. And I was out for a walk with my son last night through the forest. When you are collecting dandelion greens, for eating, you want to get them where you're walking um, somewhere off the beaten path, not on somebody's lawn. That way you can avoid any chance of pesticides or um, other contaminants. So this was off in the forest, off the beaten trail. I Slugs. still gave it a good wash. <laughs> and so this, um, as actually there's a quote that I heard recently, um, it's by Ralph Waldo Emerson. What is a weed? A plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. So um, this weed is often really um, undervalued, but it has vitamin A and B2, vitamin C, vitamin K, more iron than spinach. So it's a wonderful plant, a little bit bitter, so you wanna combine it with um, some of the lighter, maybe greenhouse greens. So I'm gonna rip a little bit of this up, throw this in our salad. A bit of greens of the dandelion. We're going to combine that with a few of these nice fresh greens from the greenhouse. And some cucumber. So I'll do a very light cut. If you can see this right here, we'll just do half moons. Cucumber, throw that in, and then some of this uh, lovely shallot. Now, a shallot, I call this the pretentious onion. It is used often in the Food Network and other kind of cooking shows. Uh, it just has a more subtle flavor, and I appreciate it for um, how good it is in raw things. So, can they see this okay over here? Ken? Oh, yeah, it's a bit blurry. Okay, so here's your shallot. We're gonna throw in a little bit of our fresh rhubarb. If you're using fresh rhubarb in anything, just like any strong vegetable or fruit, slice it very thin. And it will add that little kick of flavor 
without overpowering it. So I'm gonna give it very thin. Can you see this right here? Uh, nice close up on that. Move the sure. stand. Yeah, you can move the entire stand. <laughs> you can. There we go. I'm going to throw that in. And of course, some of these beautiful tomatoes. So I'm going to use this more as a garnish. And then as the salad sits and is ready to get the final thing, we're going to turn on our, our fire. I'm going to do the sear very quickly. Um, I'm just using a light canola oil. You can do the canola, maybe a little bit of avocado with that as well. Anything that has a high smoking point will work. If you use butter, be careful of, there you go, you can. There, do you want to bring it around to the other side and come sure. this way? Okay, Cam's just going to get a good, a good view. Um, a little bit of a note on um, the oils that you use. If you're using butter, all of the milk ingredients have the tendency to burn quickly. They have a very low smoking point. So I would suggest either clarified butter, where you melt the butter and you just pour off the top, or an oil with a high smoking point. Avoid things like olive oil because they also tend to burn quickly. So let's take our fish. As soon as I see the oil moving on the pan, it starts to kind of move and spread. You know it's ready to go. You should also hear a sizzling sound. If you don't hear a sizzling sound, don't quite place it yet, so you can leave it up here for now. Um, we can take some of our ingredients aside and get some of our plating ready while we wait for this to get a little bit warmer. Maybe give this a quick. Mm, that is wonderful. With that extra little bit of tang, it's just perfect. So what I'll do is I'll give this a quick toss with our dressing, get it plated so we can put our fish on top. You'll notice I'm not using it all. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, What's really important is the shoots and greens that I found from Vegetate Market Garden. They deliver them now to anybody who is interested. And they're a wonderful addition to a salad right now. And they are available all spring. So as soon as I get these fish on the pan and you hear that sizzle, this only takes a couple minutes to cook. We are going to plate everything else. So I'll get some of those shoots. So these are a mixture of pea shoots and various, uh, this one, these ones are pea and sunflower. So I'm going to throw a few of those in. So the combination of green, pea and sunflower shoots, greenhouse green, and dandelion green. For garnish, I'm going to place a couple of tomatoes on the, on the plate, plate my beautiful greens, throw some extra shallots and whatnot on top, and a couple pieces of rhubarb for pretty. And then chai flowers are another beautiful um, and tasty herb that's often considered a weed. So I'm just going to toss a few chai flowers on top. You see how the colors look so beautiful together. There we go. And a couple more for for color of the rhubarb. Now let's take a look over at our fish over here. Let's see what color we have. Oh yeah, this is going to be beautiful. Cam, can you manage to get over here and take a look at this fish? 
even if you get a little bit closer. You see that fish over there? I'm going to turn it just so you can see a beautiful seared fish. There's our seared walleye. And here is our plate over here of the green. In about 30 seconds, I'm going to place this together and we've got a beautiful lunch. Um, you'll also notice that this lunch is, um, as I'm a specialty caterer, the lunch is gluten free, dairy free, keto friendly. Um, there's all sorts of wonderful benefits to this. It's uh, got a lot of nutrients when you combine the nutrients you find in the fish and in your salad. So you might feel like, oh, this is a little bit too healthy. I don't know about that. So I also made some beet cupcakes for my son and I. And if anyone's interested, I can send you the recipe as well. But these, these are a perfect complement if you feel like, I don't know, I didn't get enough carbs in this dish. Um, you can make yourself a little batch of, um, of the all natural red velvet cupcakes made with beef. So let's plate this all together. And Hammond and I are going to enjoy a gorgeous lunch. And there we are. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Rhonda. That looks You're awesome. welcome. <laughs> I'm super excited for my lunch now, too. <laughs> so thank you, Rhonda, for joining us. And thank you to your cameraman as well. That was great. And so yeah, thank you, all you to all of our presenters and all of our participants today. I think I can, if I can speak for everyone, I had a blast. Um, so just uh, to thank you again. Um, we want your feedback on um, the series that we're doing um, because it's something new. So if you have any ideas um, or just give us your feedback on how you thought today went. Uh, so there will be a quick survey that will be in your inbox. Um, so keep an eye out for that, which will be sent out shortly. And if you complete it, um, you can also enter for a chance to win a $20 Starbucks gift card. Um, so for any more information on Gen Next or on our upcoming series, visit our website at uatbay.ca for more information uh, you, and again come back and join us on july 14th for best bang for your buck so thank you so much for joining us everyone we really appreciate it and have a great rest of your day Catherine, Catherine, thank you thank you as well a great host thanks colleen so have a great day everyone <laughs>